As I told you, I want to so live that God doesn't have to give me one minute's notice to step out of time into eternity. I want to live in heaven on earth. Not just wait till I get there. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth. I am earth. I happen to be earth. I came out of the earth. I go back to the earth. One thing, the world won't get too much out of me, you know. <laughs> They'll have a feast on some of you, won't get much out of me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Where is the fear of God? The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. I've been reading about the book on Knowing God by J.I. Packer. It's a wonderful book. And he says it's an awesome thing to live every day conscious that the eye of God is on you. My mother took me on one side when I was seven and said, Len, I can't always see you where you are, but remember this, the eye of God never fails. That's been a wonderful protection to me all my life. Even if I was tempted. What about God looking? My mother isn't there. No one's here. Somebody asked, as a matter of fact, it was a bishop of Bradford in England. He was a bishop of God. Uh, Edward and Mrs. Simpson thrown out of the country. That's a good job. Best thing maybe ever did, but anyhow. <laughs> he asked a class of children one day, what is the saying? A little red-headed boy that back put his hand up. He said, a bloke, meaning a guy that's good when there's nobody looking. <laughs> Isn't that a good definition of a saying? Why are you good? Because somebody's watching you? A bloke is somebody good when nobody's looking. I fear the people and I obey their voice. Verse 26, Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee. See? <coughs> Remember the moment when, Israel, when the Jews said, We reject Jesus Christ, get out of here. He said, You're too late, I've already rejected you. Your house is left desolate. And for 2,000 years, the Jews have been a football of the world. I think they'll still get kicked out of Israel once more. Because they returned in unbelief, they didn't return for the Messiah. They get kicked out, they get so persecuted, they almost crawl all the way to the country. And don't feel too comfortable. Persecution will come here. Somebody told me that a local preacher said recently that three great nations are going to collapse. Well, that's been in Time magazine for two or three years, and nothing prophetic about that. I believe mean, it's going to happen. All that has to happen is that uh, Mexico won't pay bills. All that has to happen is that Brazil, with a bigger bank balance, a debt, and where's my special? Is that right? We've got the bank inspector here tonight to watch. It's dangerous. The fear of God, is that all that frightens us? What about the wrath of God that, that like a canopy over America tonight? God doesn't owe you a thing. The times he's knocked at your heart and you're fooled and sinned and backslidden and you've got God on a string. Not so. Not so. I read a book yesterday. Somebody sent it to me. I was born the thing. By a famous preacher. I'm going to preach with him before too long. The book is, uh, what was it now? One saved, always saved. I'll tell you what, go to hell. One in hell, it's always saved. No exit. There's no parole in hell. It's forever and ever. If the church believes that, this place will be packed. You'll be weeping already for your lost parents, your lost children, your lost in-laws. We don't believe it. It's a theological chemist in our minds, that's all. <coughs> Jesus says, you haven't rejected me, I've rejected you. Your house is left desolate. You know that really means bankrupt, empty. They haven't had a profit from that day to this. There hasn't been a revival amongst Jews as far as I know in 2,000 years. And it's a desperate situation. We don't think much. Let me try and put a piece of poetry together. I didn't think of it till this moment. In fact, I only heard it once, I think. I was about 12. And I don't know who wrote it, but it went like this. Oh, England, thou privileged nation, how truly thy children are blessed. Thou hast since the great Re reformation have liberty, riches and rest such blessings are not of thy making tis God who has given thee all but if divine laws thou art breaking like Babylon too thou shalt go <coughs> thy armies and navies will fail thee if thus the Lord God thou forsake political schemes won't avail thee if sacred commandments thou break for God has his eyes on this nation to England to, the, oh England, to thee will be sent the doom of thy death condemnation 
except thou accept thou repent. Find an old hymn book and find Kipling's recessional. You hear people quote so often that statement, the tumult and the shouting dies, the captains and the kings depart. Well that comes from that great recessional. How's it begin, Martha? Tell me. Okay. I'll tell you. I'll tell you then, dear. <laughs> God of our fathers known of all, God of our far-flung battle line, beneath whose awful hands we hold dominion over palm and time, God of the nations, spare us yet, lest we forget, lest we forget, the tumult and the shouting dies, the captains and the kings depart, still stands thine ancient sacrifice, a humble that comes by heart. Lord God of hosts, be with us yet, lest we forget, lest we forget. Far called, our navies melt away. Or Dune and Headland sinks the fire. See all our pomp of yesterday is one with Nineveh and Tyre. Lord of the nations, spare us yet, lest we forget, lest we forget. But England forgot. 1914, the 4th of August, I remember the day, watching my cousin go down the street. Came to tell his aunt, my dear mother. I'm going to the army. I had a red jacket on, nice blue trousers, a big white red stripe down the side. He marched down the, belonging to the Grenadier Guards. You couldn't be in that team, I was going to say. That army unless you were over six feet, and he was about six feet. Well, that's how he went. He came back crippled. Thousands of men. You know, if the church had been as guilty of folly as politicians, they'd have burned the thing out. What are we doing? We're two trillion dollars in debt now, aren't we? Two trillion, that's all. One good bit of news I heard tonight. They were going to pass a law to make all homeschooled illegal. They didn't pass it today. They said, no, not, we didn't do it yet, but they're going to try. They're going to bring all schools under subjection, private schools, Christian schools, home schools. You'll have to take the dope the government gives out. I don't know about Mr. White very much. He doesn't seem very white to me. Hope he gets kicked out. Would you tell him if you see him? <laughs> The Lord has rejected thee from being king. Okay, that's verse 26. Verse 28. Samuel said unto him, The Lord has rent the kingdom from Israel and given from thee this day and given it to a neighbor of thine who is better. Oh, boy, isn't that humiliating. Takes it from a king and gives it to a shepherd boy. You can smell the stinking sheep on his clothes. Verse 29. Also the strength of Israel will not lie or repent. Chapter 16, verse 1. The Lord said unto Samuel, How long will thou mourn for Saul? God hadn't killed him. There's a time to quit mourning. Do you know what mourning turns into self pity? You've got to cut it off and say, That's it. I'm not going to mourn for that person who's gone. I'm not going to mourn for that person who's hurt my feelings. I found out years ago, when I mourn the devil's laugh, so one day I cursed him. I said, Get out of my life, you monster. You're happy when I mourn. You're happy when I'm down. Get out of my life. I'm not going to be down. I'm not going to mourn. I'm mourn for the last. I'm mourn for revival. But I'm not going to mourn over personal injury. God help me, I'm not a child. I hope I'm not. The trouble is God can't get us to go up. We're so injured. A pin creek. It's like the lady, she had a, what do you call it, a hangnail. So she called the pastor, thought the church should have a night of prayer. <laughs> for a healing. Oh, I didn't put this on. It's okay. It's just as well off, maybe. <laughs> Verse 16, pardon me, chapter 16, verse 1. How long thou wilt mourn for Saul? Seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel. Fill thine horn with oil, and I send thee to Jesse, to the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king from among his sons. <coughs> verse 4. Samuel did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. He spoke to the people of Bethlehem. Listen, and the elders of the town trembled at his coming. Dear God, do you know a preacher that if you, you said, if the cops stopped somebody and said, what are you doing, carrying dope? No, I've got rain mill here. Oh, oh, don't tell the city fathers, they'll all have another breakdown. Rain mills come? I know churches that would almost do that, but not city fathers. <laughs> I'd love that. I'd love to be, I've told you, I want to be on the devil's list of most wanted men in America. Any other list? Forget it. 
I'm wanting God to give me a prophetic ministry. There isn't a prophet in America tonight, as far as I know. Some with prophetic urgency, prophetic style, but not a prophet. You never found a prophet beg from anybody. The prophet gives, he doesn't ask. His word is, thus saith the Lord, and that's it. Come hell or high water, he doesn't care. And the people and the elders of the town, boy, you know, they make, get the elders of the church to tremble these days. And they said, come as thou peaceably. Isn't that wonderful? Dear Lord, I'd like to go into some churches or some areas and say, listen, I'm not coming peaceably. I'm a man of war. I'm going to tear the place up. I went to one church and the elder came to me the first night. He said, uh, you won't rock the boat, will you, Mr. Reed? I said, I sure will. I won't sink it, but I'll rock it every night I'm here. <laughs> so he didn't come. So that's fine. I don't care. You've got to shake him up somehow. Verse 5, okay, we're in what, chapter 16. And he said, Peaceably I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. It came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before me. Why? Because Eliab, Eliab's tall and dark and handsome. He's got everything that's needed to be a good politician or a good leader. This is the right man. Surely this is the Lord's anointed. The Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance. Doesn't that make you happy? You folk like me, they're not very good looking. He doesn't look on the outside. You know, if all the ladies going to church Sunday morning and spend as much time on the knees as they spent on makeup, good Lord, we'd turn the nation upside down. I told you, I lived in a house in Chicago for three or four months, and the lady said, I'm taking my Bible with me. I'll be out. Would you answer the phone? I said, sure. She said, I'm going to the beauty shop. I thought, well, you need it, but I didn't say it. <laughs> she said, you know, I've been going to this beauty shop for 20 years. I sighed. <laughs> Good Lord, what was she like when they started working? <laughs> Aren't you glad that we men are handsome? We don't have to go to beauty shops. <laughs> what a sight. <laughs> you know all they spent at that time it was considered extravagant ten dollars to get your hair done what do you pay now you ladies come on gather all that how much <laughs> gather all the money that's spent by women in churches they spend more on that stuff than they do in giving to missions most of them we spend more on dog food and cat food pet food in America than all the combined offerings to missions so how long is God Almighty going to put up with it now, that, I'm not preaching from the NIV, you know. <laughs> Verse 7, look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. Doesn't it make you happy? Yeah. Man looks on the outward appearance. You think the scripture says, when you go in church, the angels are saying, you see that lady in red there, she has a Christian day or dress or that lady over there, she has a, what do you call those, designer dress. And all the angels bow. <laughs> Three people going in that church with a designer dress and what's the shoes, Uchi Gucci shoes or whatever you call them. <laughs> oh, yesterday the precious brother... I didn't have time, Dave. I'd like to have called you in. The brother that's from uh, well, anyway, Brooklyn Tabernacle, where they have a 1500, 1600, there's a place to go for a week. Don't go to Florida, forget it. Go up in there and get into that prayer meeting for one or two nights. I preached there, I prayed there. 1500 people at the prayer meeting. But now they have a prayer meeting Friday morning, 9 to 11. He said, Brother Raymond, you can't imagine what God is doing in our church. And they prayed for an expansion. A church across the city said, look, we've only six members. We have a gorgeous building. If you'll take it, we'll give you our bank balance, $60,000. We'll give you the building. As long as you give us a man that loves God and can preach, and you supervise it. And they've gone there. And they've been there, what, less than 11 months, and the place is packed out already. He has a lineup right round his uh, 
church there was a big shindig to be on Campus Crusade actually I think it took the Carnegie Hall for Easter Monday and something went wrong pun? pun? yeah but that wasn't what it was for somebody backed down so they, they asked their choir to go so his wife went and took the choir and there was a line of right round the building Carnegie Hall they played choruses, sang choruses, the glory of God came down and they turned the whole of Carnegie Hall packed to the rafter into a prayer meeting heavyweight fights there, that's the heavy, heaviest fight that's been ever since the blessed building was put up and now he's planning to take another building who was in the building? Rockefeller, somebody told Rockefeller do you know what happened in the Carnegie Hall? I think he owns it last night they had a marvelous concert but it ended up everybody praying what? Praying? <laughs> yeah. They're looking for a bigger building. He said, well, there's another hall in town. I forgot the name of that. Carnegie holds over 2,000. 6,000, the new one. 3,000. 6,000, the new one. And they're going to have a prayer meeting. 6,000 people is going to have it. If anybody wants to pay my ticket, I might go. <laughs> but isn't it wonderful that there are people praying like that? He said, you come in our Friday morning prayer meeting, 9 to 11, it pulsates with eternity. People weep, they groan, strong men. He said, I have a man come into my church now to make Nicky Cruz look like a Boy Scout. He's been in jail seven years, he's raped, he's broken banks, he's done every devilish thing you can imagine. And he says, you couldn't imagine how peaceable. He said, I took him down to Peru with me because he speaks Spanish. He said, God just swept over the building. He said, a little Indian woman came, a high cheekbones, a typical Inca type of woman, Indian, high cheekbones, nice eyes. And she knelt and said, pray for me. She, he understands Spanish. He said, her hair was full of lice and grease and filth. And I was going to put my hand, she turned her head, I was going to put my hand, oh, mercy on us. You may as well put your hand in a pile of filth. And he said, the Lord said, I would touch her, you touch her. And he said, I put my hand on her and prayed for her and the glory of God came on the place. He, I'll tell you something later, I won't tell you now. Where he's going to go anyhow. <clears throat> the verse 10 says again, Jesse made seven of his sons pass before him. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen one of these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest. Why wasn't he there? Why wasn't David there? Because he's a bastard. I believe that. Doesn't he say in Psalm 51, I was born in sin and shaped in iniquity. And Jesse was too embarrassed to bring the child that didn't belong to him. I know we've built theology on that psalm. But again, you see, God is not impressed with the size of your head, size of your house, size of your bank balance. All he's concerned about is the size of your heart, the size of your love, the size of your compassion. But when the angel drops a, a measuring line into your heart, it keeps going down. He says, Father, I can't get to the bottom. This man's love is bottomless. This man's compassion is bottomless. Okay, verse 11 again. Samuel said unto Jesse, Are these all thy children? He said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he's a keeper of the sheep. In other words, what are you going to get, a little shepherd lad? He's no candidate for being a sheep. He's no education. He's a country bumpkin. He doesn't know anything. He's no manners. He couldn't go into a royal court. Are you suggesting that boy of mine with the stinking sheep is going to be king? He says, I do do as I tell you. He keepeth sheep, and Samuel said to Jesse, Send and fetch him, for he will not, we will not sit down. Now remember, he's already been anointed in the previous chapter. He'd been anointed as a king, and yet he's humble enough, because Jesus was anointed, but he served. You know, we don't want to serve. We want to be chiefs, not Indians.
Okay. I'll find it just now. The end of verse 11 again. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him. Now he was ruddy. We would say he's a healthy looking fellow. And withal had a beautiful countenance and goodly to look at. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. And Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon, upon him from that day forward. Now this is his first anointing, but notice he anointed him private, in the privacy of his own home. In Psalm 89 verse 20 says, I have anointed him with holy oil. In 2 Samuel 1 and verse 4 it says he was anointed again by the men of Judah. In, Sa in the verse, chapter 5 and verse 13 he was anointed again by the elders of Israel. And Christ was anointed three times. I'm not going to dig that up for you. You can dig it out yourselves. What did it say at the end of this 13th verse of 2 Samuel 16? Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of the brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. But look at the next verse. The Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord came upon him. What a difference. up so we don't take too much time here. <coughs> Verse 18. Then answered one of the servants and said, Behold, I have seen the son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite. He is cunning in playing, and a mighty valiant man, and a man of war, and prudent in matters, and a comely person, and the Lord is with him. Wherefore Saul sent messengers unto Jesse and said, Send me David thy son, which is with the sheep. Verse 21, David came to Saul and he made him his armor bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he hath found favor in my sight. It came to pass when the evil spirit of God was upon him that Saul took a harp and played with his hand. And Saul was refreshed and became well. He was healed. Isn't that wonderful? Because of the presence of the man of God. Chapter 17. <clears throat> Verse 3. The Philistines stood on one side of the mountain, and Israel stood on the other side. And there was a valley between them, and there went out a champion of the Philistines named Goliath, whose height was six cubits, which is just a little over nine feet. Quite a man. He had a helmet of brass on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was five thousand shekels of brass. Good night, he must have been strong to hold that thing up. Verse 11 says, When Saul and all Israel heard the words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David was the son of the Ephraimite, Bethlehem Judah. His name was Jesse, and he had eight sons. Well, I read part of that. Let me go down to verse 28 again, which I mentioned. Eliab, the eldest brother, heard upon oh, me. Let me go back to 15, verse 15. David went, returned from Saul to feed the father's sheep at Bethlehem. And the Philistine drew near morning and evening for 40 days. 40 is always a period of testing. The book of Matthew is the 40th book in the Bible. The Jews were tested by the presence of the Lord Jesus and they failed. Jesus was in the wilderness 40 days and 40 nights. Moses on the backside of the desert 40 years. 40 is always a time of testing, severe testing. Come on, before God, could you be on the backside? Some of you can't be 40 minutes alone. You rush off to somebody's house. You wouldn't come to my house, I'll throw you out. A guy this week said, I must come and talk with you for four hours. I said, yeah, another guy wants to come for four hours. Another wants to come for two hours. One man said, I want to stay with you 21 days. Well, go to the coach light. They'll be glad to have you. Not come to my house. We don't think, any, we wouldn't ever think of stealing somebody's purse, but we'll steal their time. 
Oh, I just go in. Of course, I'm a saint. I want you to hear my testimony. I've heard it, friend. I don't want to hear it anymore. Don't waste my time. Oh, I'm young. I'm only 23. Plenty of time. Have you? There's somebody in the cemetery your age. Go have a look at the grave. If you're really as close to God as that, that you're willing, that you've nothing else to learn, you can't, don't want to be more intimate with Him, you don't want any more revelation from Him, you don't want any more burden in prayer, waste your time. Don't waste anybody else's. He'll charge you at the judgment seat. Time's precious. We talk about tithing. Who tithes the time? If you give God a tenth of every day, you give Him two hours and twenty-four minutes. Are you behind? Some people then die. If they haven't given the tithe to the last minute, they think Peter will meet them at the gate and say, you're $560 behind. But we don't think about our time. It's my time. It isn't. It's God's time. My dear wife was saying yesterday, how when young people get saved in their church, they bring a scripture and say, what are you bringing to Jesus? Your lousy sins? He'll forgive your sins. But remember, when you say, I'm sorry, and repent, and become a child of God, you're bought with a price. You've no rights to yourself, no right to your time, no right to... Are you going to be a doctor? Put it on the altar. You're going to be a lawyer? Put it on the altar. He wants everything there is of you, not just something. Find out what God wants and do it. Don't be a tramp going from here to there and here to there. I think if I came and lived with you for a while, you might be up the wall in a week. I don't want you to come and live with me. I'll be friendly with you, I'll be kind, I'll pray as best I can. But you know, we don't value time. You ought to value every precious moment you have. I, I tell you, I, I laid in for months in a straitjacket in hospital. It was agony. I couldn't stand it. There I was. I couldn't move anywhere. It's the only time I've been tied down, but I tell you, it was tough. But you know, time and again, I thought, my, if I was only fit. Do you know why God stopped me? Because I was going on a tour of the world to preach. I was going too fast. And God says, stop. Be still and know that I'm God. That's as real as be filled with the Holy Spirit, but we don't stress it. You can't flutter, trip around here, there and everywhere. Keep out of other people's houses. Mind your own business. And if you go, don't gossip for God's sake. Keep your mouth shut. If you've nothing to say, go back home and stay home. Do most of us good to stay at home three months and see nobody? Oh, well, it's better going down there. I like the fellowship better. Why? Are you a failure at home? You won't get any more here than you get at home if you seek God. Isn't there a hymn that says, Could I be cast where thou art not? Was that Madame Gian that said, Could I be cast where thou art not? That were indeed a dreadful spot. But with thee, my God, to guide the way, it is equal joy to go or stay. The grass is always greener there. Look, God can make you in a room by yourself. I had a precious young man came to see me three weeks ago. His father's extremely wealthy, a banker. He li his daddy lives in a palace. He's chosen to live in one room down the road, somewhere up in... Uh, over Alabama way, or Carolinas. And the lady wrote to me, she said, You can't believe what this young man has, how he's moved in God. He got your book two years ago. Why did I will tell it? He's been shut away. He spends X number of hours every day in prayer. Come on, why do you go to other people's houses to talk? Why don't you pray? Spend the time in prayer. There's not much time left. Again, I say, it sounds facetious maybe. I believe the choice in America is either we concentrate in prayer or we pray in concentration camps. You say it can't happen, it will. God's patience is running out. And we shouldn't have to be driven with our backs to the wall to pray. We should pray because God wants me to pray. He invites me every day to pray. I can't get enough time to pray. I'll get through this in a little while, I promise you. <coughs> so anyhow, this man's come for 40 days, it says in verse 16 of the 17th chapter. Morning and night. How do you think that people were anxious and aggravated? They look at Saul's tent. There it is, the tent. You know, they, well, they, all, they have the old stand of tent like this, you know. Uh, uh, there's a pole in the middle to keep it up. And they see the sign. There's where King Saul is. That's the other royal tent where Jonathan is. That's where the elders of Israel are. Look at this uncircumcised Philistine mocking us, laughing at us, scorning us. These are people who say their God divided the Red Sea. But their God gave them shoes that didn't wear out in 40 years and clothes that didn't smell after 40 years. 
And God opened heaven and sent them cereal down every morning. Always fresh and good. But if you got greedy, it went rotten. This is the God that's been challenged by this uncircumcised Philistine. Verse 20, David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper. He didn't let them run around. And he went, as Jesse had commanded him, and he came to the trench or the valley as the host was going forth in the fight and sh shouted for the battle. The Israelites and the Philistines put the battle in array against the army. And he left his carriage, his accoutrements, in the hand of a keeper and ran to the army and, and saluted his brethren. And when he talked with them, there came up the champion Philistine of Gath, whose name was Goliath. He came out of the armies of the Philistines and spake according to the same words. And David heard them as he challenged God. And all the men of Israel, when they saw him, fled, ran for their lives. They're all trained in military warfare. When it comes to the crisis, they run. Supposing there's an invasion of communists tonight, they come in their thousands. And you wake up in the morning and discover them in the street. Will your faith hold up? They say, you're going to prison for two years. We say, you know, God tells secrets. Yes, he tells secrets. Oh, you know, God blessed Abraham. Yes, I'll tell you how he blessed him. He said, your children are going into bondage for 400 years. Would you like God to tell you that? The only way you can learn to know God is in secret. I'm going to put the whole nation into bondage, into slavery. They're going to make bricks for 400 years, four centuries. You don't hear people prophesying that kind of stuff, do you? Usually it's good things. I see now people are saying, lay this up, food up. Isn't that ridiculous? You know, say you've got umpteen, whatever that is, umpteen bags of flour and uh, half a pig in a backyard somewhere, or not in the backyard, I mean, but you've got it in cold storage, and you've told people, what do you think is going to happen when the starvation, they all come to your house first, they'll smash the door down, break the windows, and they leave it up, and you'll have to watch them. And so they should. Don't tell them I gave them information, but there you are. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how we can trust God when we've everything? Uh, give us this day our daily bread, and you've got the refrigerator packed to the ceiling. We're trusting God, and have another refrigerator in the garage. Come on, who are we fooling? Maybe God's going to test us. I don't have any amens tonight, do you notice? Brother Dale, you're back in a Quaker meeting tonight. <clears throat> Let me skip over to this. I'm doing leapfrogging, but I have to for time. 28. Eliab, the eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled. Isn't that something? Wouldn't you think he'd say, son, I hope you can do it? I'm your brother. Instead of that, he's angry. It isn't Jonathan, the king's son, who's angry with him. He should have been jealous. And say, listen, if you slay that man, you'll become number one. And I don't know where I'll have to go. But it isn't Jonathan, the son, who's envious. Some chairs. It isn't Jonathan, the son who's envious of him. It's one of his own brother, his family, his own flesh and blood. And all you have to do is get into a closer walk with God and you'll find your enemies are in your own church. God help you if you get more spiritual than the pastor. You might as well be in purgatory nearly. <laughs> it's dangerous. I get letters all over from young people who've had to leave our church. And they haven't done anything wrong. Oh no, if you, can, if you get divorced, you can stay in the church. It's only just when you say, well, I don't want to be worldly. I can't go to movies anymore. I can't go to ball parks anymore. I can't pass a beer on the line. I can't listen to the profanity behind me. They take the name of Jesus in there. And immediately you do that, you're marked. It wasn't his, uh, again, it wasn't Jonathan. His brother Eliab, we're now in chapter 17 of First Samuel, verse 28. Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men. Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why camest down thou hither? With whom scornfully have you left those flew she sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and naughtiness of thine heart. That's a very, very common disease. We all know the pride in someone else, we don't know the pride in ourselves. 
I know the naughtiness, the weakness of your heart, but I won't tell you the weakness of mine. Isn't it amazing? We have so many unprofessional psychologists in churches. They all know what's wrong with the deacons, they know what's wrong with that Sunday school. They saw the organist winking at the pastor one day and thought the heaven should fall. I know thy pride and naughtiness of thine heart. How wonderful. Listen to this. For thou art come down here to see the battle. Boy, David was short there. I'd have said, where is the battle? You've been here for months. Where is the battle? Yes, I'd like to see the battle. You go fight that monster. That man that terrifies you, nine feet high, and you run away from him. He's only flesh and blood anyhow. David said, what have I now done? Is there another cause? That's a great text to preach on. And he turned from him toward another and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again, after the former manner. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul. And he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with his Philistine. And the king said, Saul said, you can't go against this man, this Philistine, with him. You're just a boy. And he's a man of war from his youth. He knows all the tricks. He knows all the logistics. He knows all the methods of fighting. That's his occupation and you don't know a thing about it. He said, no, but let me tell you something. Verse 23, 33. Saul said thou art, to David, thou art not able to join to this Philistine to fight with him. For thou art a youth and he a man of war. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went after him and smote him. And I delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose after me, I caught him by his beard. Wouldn't that be something? Not taking a tiger by the tail, but taking a lion by his beard. That takes some doing. I would like to try it. But notice this. God says the man that's faithful in secret will reward him openly. Nobody applauded him when he chased that lion. Nobody applauded him when he chased the bear. He heard the squealing, crying of the little thing in the mouth that the teeth were going to crunch it. And he has a shepherd's heart, so he doesn't care. I heard just yesterday from a brother from New York uh, talking about a child, a seven-year-old boy who the house was burning and the neighbors were all there. Oh, isn't it terrible? Isn't it terrible? I think the little boy got out, but there's a little boy in there, I, I think. Well, why don't we go in? And suddenly the little guy ran in the side door. He jumped up through a window and went in and came out with his little baby brother, two years old, in his hand. So how did he do that? The fireman didn't do it. He said, I heard my brother cry. I heard my brother cry. I couldn't let my brother die. You could have been burned up. He said, I know that. But it's my brother. It was my brother's cry. I know his voice. And I went in. Well, how many brothers have you got crying? Going to burn in hell fire forever. When did you last try and reach them? When did you last fast and pray? People say I get tough. Sure, I don't want to train Boy Scouts. I want some of you to be warriors. I want some of you to really lay in dust, life's glory dead, and say, I don't care in God's name what happens. My career, my future, my friends. We used to sing a hymn. Here I give my all to thee, friends and time and earthly store. A friend of mine was standing by a precious young lady that he was going to he'd be started courting. They'd already bought the house, he bought the furniture. And as he was singing that, Here I give my all to thee, friends and time and earthly store, soul and body thine to be only thine forevermore. The Lord said, do you mean that? You know, we sing more lies in church every Sunday than they do in all the taverns in Tyler in a week. We're the whole realm of nature, man. And people could have been here tonight, they're not. And the Lord said, this young lady you're going to marry in six months. You say you'll give your all, I'll take her. An earthly store, you've got a house packed with furniture. Sell it all. Go out of the meeting, tell her, darling, I can't marry you for six months to a year. I'm going to a college. You went to a college I went to, by the way. And the first week he was there, I believe it was. He'd been saved from drink. He'd been saved from hell. He woke up one morning with a burden for the college. It didn't even change. It's, there are no girls in that college. He just ran down in his pajamas and started crying before God in the third lecture hall where we had most of our lectures. At one o'clock in the morning, by half past one, the college was empty. The place was just roaring with men weeping and seeking God. 
The greatest revival he ever had in that school. It, it cost him all. My friends, my time, my earthly store, soul and body time to be. You know, we want to give God our lousy sins. What do you think he does with them? He wants that will. He wants that career of yours. He wants that selfish heart to not with selfishness. You're thinking about little me. Oh, I'd like to go here. It's so nice being here. Oh, so get rid of yourself. Go to some hell hole and work. I've done it. I know what it means. My dear wife, my precious boys, went through the first two or three years of, of the founding of uh, Team Challenge in New York when it was rough and tough. When, if we got $20, we almost had a war dance around the building. $5, $20, you can't believe, $20 in the offering? Good night, you get that, I expect 20000 a week. But I'm glad they went through that tough school. I've been reading the dear Mother Shaw, you asked who she was. She was the eldest daughter of the founder of the Salvation Army. She lived to be 95. She came to a conference I had in a big church in England. And I, I watched the tears, her face was craggy and the tears were spilling over. We were singing a hymn she wrote, There is a love constraining me to go and seek the lost. And I said to myself, I'm not standing by the Mother Shaw, she's still in Paris. Or she's still in Switzerland. The judge said to her one morning in Switzerland, now you go to jail. Be back here, where are you going? Side two. The judge said to her one morning in Switzerland, now you go to jail. Be back here, where are you going? I'm going back to France. You've got to be back here at 9 o'clock next uh, Monday morning and start a prison sentence for blocking the traffic in the street with your street meeting. She said, no, Your Honor. He said, I say yes. She said, well, I say no. Are you defying the law? You won't be here at 9 o'clock? Why? She said, because I'm starting a prison sentence in front. I just got one or two friends like herself and went to a hellhole and went to the basement. As I've told you, you never have to advertise a fire. You never have to beg when there's a real Holy Ghost fire. Colonel Brangle came from this country. They said he'd be the greatest lawyer, he, he may be a president. He led it all on one side and left a little place in, uh, what was the place, I forget the name, Newcastle, in Pennsylvania. I, I pulled in on the train there one night, and as I got off, I thought, well, this is the very place where Colonel Bringle went, with all his degrees. And the first job William Booth gave, he said, you clean the shoes of the boys. So he cleaned a hundred of those boots, they came up to the knees, and he worked and worked, and the devil said, cleaning shoes? <laughs> you a doctor of divinity? You? You explain the Greek? These boys don't know the difference between a Greek root and a rhubarb root. And you're polishing their shoes. And he said, yes. And he said, it was there I made a commitment to God. And he became one of the outstanding men in the history of the mighty, mighty salvation. I'm, I'm sick of mediocrity. I'm sick of men begging for money. I'm sick of men saying this is the will of God and they abandon it six months after God helped them. God's going to do some new things. He's going to find some new men. I sure I get excited about it. Why not? You can get excited about kicking a pigskin round the field. I can get excited about the glory and will of God anyhow. Oh. I've got to read that again and enjoy it. Verse 35. There's a lion, verse 34. There came a lion and a bear, and I took a lamb out of the flock. I went after him and smote him. I'd like to see him punching the nose of that lion. I caught him by his beard. Boy, that must have hurt. And I smote him. Verse 36, thy servant slew both a lion and a bear. Now for the Philistine. I've had training in the quietness. I got rid of a lion and a bear. Nobody else dare face them. It doesn't say there's anybody. It says I got rid of them. He didn't whistle for help and say, anybody around there's a bear here. Get over his tail while I punch his nose. He slew the lion. He slew the bear. I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. That's three times. Didn't you enjoy that? Thy servant both, servant both slew a lion and a bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. He, he wasn't doing it for the king's sake. He wasn't doing it for the, God, for the, for the uh, nation's sake. He was doing it for God's sake. They defied the armies of the living God. Verse 37, the Lord delivered me out of the paw of the lion, out of the paw of the bear. And he will deliver me. He's prophesying now. Look in verse 37. Skip over to that. See what he says. Oh, we're in verse 37. That's right. He delivered me out of the mouth of the lion, out of the mouth of the bear. Ah. 
And Saul said unto him, Go, and the Lord be with thee. And Saul armed David with his armor. Isn't that great? He put on a helmet of brass, and he couldn't see where he was going. The helmet covered his whole head, he couldn't see where he was going. Gave him a breastplate, could hardly wear the thing. He says, Here's my sword. He girded him with his sword of his armor, and he hesitated to go. He said, I cannot fight with these. You see, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. We're borrowing everything the devil has. They've got rock music, we've got Christian rock music. Sick stuff that it is. This man is content to fight alone, fight a dare, save a poor lamb, fight a lion in the darkness, in the danger of the night, without anybody help, anybody's help. And at the end of verse 39, David said, I cannot go with these. And he put them off. Come on, boy, why don't you do that? That's ridiculous. I mean, when you walk down in that, do you know what I think? I think when David wrote this psalm afterwards, I, I, I'm not afraid in the valley of the shadow of death. I think he's referring to the time he walked down there when that man said, I'll take you and break you over my knee and throw the bits to the birds. The valley of the shadow of death, but he feared no evil, for God was with him. Verse 8, he armed David with his armor, put on his he a helmet of brass, a coat of mail, girded him with his sword upon his armor, and he hesitated to go, for he could not prove it. He hadn't proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these things. And David put them off. Don't you think he marched down into the valley there with that most gorgeous helmet there was in the whole world of the king and the king's breastplate? All the trimmings of the king. But you see, this man isn't showing off. You know, young preachers, I talk with the young preachers, I say, you young guys, you're fighting to get all the exposure you can. That's stupid. I was stupid myself once. Oh, I wish this door would open for me. I, I'm praying doors will close for me. I don't want doors to open, I want doors to shut. But we want exposure. How will you get known? Get known in heaven. Get known in hell. If you're not known in hell, I don't care what crowd you sing to in rock concerts. I'll preach to as far as that goes. If I'm not on the devil's danger list, I'm not worth much. They knew when, 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 knew when Samson was anointed. And they knew when this man was anointed. You see, he that see, is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. Verse 41, 41, the Philistines came near to David. And the man that bare the shield went before. Isn't that wonderful? Here's a man nine feet high and he has a man with a big shield in front of him. David's got nothing. David says, you come to me with a sword and a spear. That's the two barrels on the gun, isn't it? He throws the javelin, if he misses, well, he's going to chop him up. But he's got problems. The Philistine looked out down and saw David, and he disdained him. He was contemptuous. He's only a youth, ruddy, fair countenance. The Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David. You know what? Let everybody in the world curse you, the devil and all hell. If God has blessed you, it won't make that much difference. It shouldn't make that much difference to you. Let them curse you. Let them blast you. Let them misrepresent you. You see, what this man does in every crisis is alone. We want to lean on everybody. Stand on your feet. Or as I say, get on your knees, you'll stand on your feet. The test is when you're alone. He was alone when he met the bear. He was alone when he met the lion. He's alone. Here's a crowd of people here on the top of the hill. All the tents of Israel. And there's the valley and all the tents at the other side are the tents of the Philistines. And they're all peeping around the tent and say, Oh, that poor kid. And Eliab says, What will we say? tell Daddy when we go home? We saw our own brother chewed up by that big monster of a fellow. Forget it. The Philistines said to David, Come to me, I'll give you flesh to the fowls of the air and the beasts of the field. Listen, David says, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord. Isn't that great? What a stupid man this big Goliath was. I heard a lady the other day trying to sing. It was pretty good. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I be afraid? Well, David wrote that. The Lord is my light. Do you remember in the 15th chapter of 
Genesis, God says to Abraham, I am thy shield. Not I'll give you a shield. Not that I'll be a shield between you. Not that I'll give you. I am your shield. Look, if you're in the will of God and you have a shield, all hell won't break you. All hell won't turn you back. I am thy shield. The resources of God are behind him. This man says, God is my strength. So what do you look at? A mountain of flesh there. So what? He's not afraid of that. Everybody else is afraid. Everybody else wants to use karma methods. You know, if we eat more money and govern more stations, why do they want money? To spread the weakness they've got? I mean, they can't do it under 25 or 200 stations alone. Why in God's name do you want to be 200 mother stations? More stations. You know, we're making a substitute. If I could get this money, if I could do this, if I could do that, we will not do anything except crawl on our bellies before God and say, of the refuge have I none. Is the scripture says it's the lame that take the prey? We read that 40th chapter of Isaiah, they shall mount up with wings as eagles. We don't read the verse before. It talks about weakness, the weak being strong. You look up in Corinthians, see how often Paul says, I'm weak and you're weak. If you're weak, I want to be weak. My weakness is my strength, my sufficiency, my self-strength is no good. <clears throat> you to me with a spear and with a shield. I'm not worried. The Lord is my light. The Lord is my salvation. I mentioned the three anointings. Let me just not, not mention them except, I may not go explicitly to them. But after those three anointings, this trouble begins. Uh, I wonder what, what's the proof I'm filled with the Holy Ghost? Number one, you live a holy life. Number two, you're easy to live with. Number three, you'll get cartloads of trouble you've never had in your life before. <laughs> they hardly got out of the upper room. They were in prison. And they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to prosper. No, no, no. That's the Dallas version. <laughs> That's as ugly as the elephants. They came out of the upper room and they rejoiced they were counted worthy. They hardly got out of the upper room. They're in jail. Why? What does the early church do? It does everything Jesus did except walk on water. He delegated his power. And I'm not just thinking of miracles like, again, physical, though they're wonderful. I've seen many of them, all kinds, except raise the dead. I've seen blind people, a blind man got his eyesight when we prayed for him, seen people leap out of the church. But that doesn't trouble me too much now. I want to see miracles in character. I want to see people with integrity. I want to see people with... A there's many Christians, you can't trust them. They'll say one thing, forget it, they won't do it. Don't tell me to fill with the Holy Ghost and speak in tongues. I don't care if you stand on your head and speak in tongues. If you've no character, if you've no loyalty, if you've no integrity, if you're not steadfast in love, if you haven't the compassion for the lost, if you say, Lord, let me get to the lions and the bears, forget the pastor. You come to me with a sword and a spear, I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts. And the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied and despised. Verse 47, all this assembly shall know the Lord saveth not with sword and spear. Isn't he prophesying again? He's a boy, isn't he? So the battle is the Lord's. You see, you, he thought it, you thought it's your battle. Well, if it's your battle, fight it. Use your flesh, use your brilliance, use your smartness. But when you say, other refuge have I none, hangs my helpless soul on thee, it's then when God turns the heat on and he begins to deliver. We move this way, we move that way, and God says, forget it. I don't believe there are many people that really know God. I don't know many people really trust God. I think having the Bible and reading it, it should be difficult to be unbelievers. But we're the biggest bunch of unbelieving believers the Lord's ever had. We're afraid we'll strain him or something, embarrass him. There's some days ahead when we're going to have to trust him. And they will trust him wholly, find him holy too. I know we had to sing that that tonight. Can I step back a minute here in verse 40? He wouldn't take the armor, he wouldn't take the sword, he wouldn't take the helmet. He took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones out of the book. Why? Why did he do that? Because Goliath had four brothers and he thought they might come and rescue them, so he was going to kill them up while he was at it. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Some boy, this David fella. 
He says, you come to me with a sword and with a, with a sword and with a spear. But listen, boy, I didn't show you this in my pocket. You see this thing? Do you know I, I'm the champion sling Thor in the Jerusalem... Uh, what, yeah, I've just... The other week... Oh, we had the Jerusalem Olympics and there were people from ten nations and I hit the target every time. And the fellow says, forget it, that's no good. I've got a sword and a spear. He says, well, do your thing. So he took him up on it. <laughs> Beautiful, verse 49. David put his hand in the bag and he took thence a stone and slung it and smote the Philistine. You see, that's the only place he had no protection. He had protection on his arms, on his body, but there he had none. And that's where the stone went, you know, and such a thing never entered his head before. <laughs> but you know what? That's where the devil's got our theologians. That's where the devil's got our boys in college. He doesn't put out their eyes, he, he hits them right in the middle there and, and knocks them unconscious. And there's no sword in the hand of David, so what did he do? He jumped on the chest of the big shot, chopped his head off with his own sword. Isn't that what the devil, God does? He's going to wreck the devil's kingdom from the inside. But the question I ask you tonight, how many Goliaths do you have in your life? And you wish somebody would help you, and you have a prayer meeting, you call on others. There's a time when you can do that. The Word of God says, in the multitude of counselors there is safety. But Paul says, in the greatest crisis of his life, I conferred not with flesh and blood. If you want somebody to explain your situation, you'll find a dozen people do it. But what does God say? I get guys come to me, I'll come and see you. I live a thousand miles away. I'll fly down. Wait a minute, what are you coming for? I want you to help me. I'm in a crisis. I need to know the mind of God. Well, I'm not God. But you can help me. I say, look, if I help you and you go on three years and everything's great and you say, hey, if you've any trouble, go see Raven. That guy has some wisdom. He got me out of the hole. And then at the end of three years, you hit a wall like that. You can't say, but God, uh, Raven told me. And God says, why didn't you ask me? If Raven got you out of the trouble, go back to him again. How do we trust him? They who trust him wholly, W-H-O-L-L-Y, they who trust him wholly, find him wholly true. Between the first and the third anointings, if you read the story, you'll find it's full of difficulty and trial. He's misunderstood by his family. That's difficult when you get there. His own brother is envious. Afterwards, what do you think his brother was like? He must have been furious. My brother... Do you know what they're doing? They're going down the main street of Jerusalem and they're singing Saul has slain his thousands but David is tens of thousands. Almost single-handedly he's delivered the nation out of the hand of that monster. You find the same thing in church history. God finds a man, raises a man. We build monuments to them after they've been dead. They're starving when they're living. They're fools when they're living. They give up a career, give up friends. It's not easy who says it is. Jesus never said the Christian life was easy. To use an old cliche I used to use in the streets at street meetings, Christianity has not, N-O-T, been weighed in the balances and found wanting. It's been tried, found difficult and rejected. It's more than giving your sins. It's more than giving up a few habits. It's giving up the rights to yourself. Do you think this fellow had the jitters? Oh, I'm going down in the valley tomorrow. And my brothers will be up there peeping out of the tent. The king won't help me. The prince Jonathan won't help me. My brothers won't help me. Oh, I'm, I'm going to go to pieces. I'm in the valley there all by myself. It's terrible. He didn't. He, God was his strength. And because of that, he feared not what should happen. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Come on now. If you say that, God has a right to put you in that situation where you've got evil against you and test you. God doesn't test you to prove you, you to him. He knows you to prove you to yourself. But much of what you say is words, it's theory, it's philosophy, it's theology. He wants to get right down to the center of my being where he has total control. I haven't fathomed that thing. I quoted it the other Saturday, I was going to say, the other Friday, where Paul says before those intellectuals on Mars Hill, He's got the Stoics and the uh, philosophers and the cream of the intellectual world there. He's got Greeks there, Jews. Everybody that's smart with it. 
And he says, I've come to tell you about the God that you don't know nothing about. In him I live and move and have my being. Tell me how you get there. You live in him. You move in him. There's nothing thing in the world that lures you. Why should the world allure me? It's a dung heap anyhow. If you see a beautiful bride going down the aisle and you say, well, darling, you... That's a Christian deodorant. Yes, it was flown from Paris for me. As a matter of fact, it's, you know, made for me personally. Beautiful. I said, did you see, as you came in, there's a pile of manure and junk there? Uh, I'd like to take you into the junkyard. There's something I want to show you. Do you think she'd go? She said, not likely. Look, if I am Jesus Christ, I want to walk in purity. I'm not looking for a way to, to sin and cover it up with eternal security. I want to hate what God hates. And he hated the enemy of God. But we've got so many Goliaths, now we can't slay them. We've got so many Ahabs, but we can't put them away. And people say, Brother Ray, they'll take comfort. 7,000 haven't bowed the knee to them. God's name, shut up. They told me that 70 years ago. I'm looking for those 7,000 to come out, show themselves, get to the issue and fight the fight of faith, fight the battle. Well, what did he do? Well, he killed a bear when there was nobody there. He must have felt good about that. He woke up in the morning, well, I guess that bear's got a sore jaw tonight, this morning. I guess that beard, the, the lion's aching, his beard's been pulled. What does he do? He says he danced before the Lord, maybe more than once. Before the Lord, not before the congregation, you know. In Dallas, we've got choreographers now. You take your dance shoes with you and they signal when you have to dance. They may as well signal when you say amen and thumbs down when you say something else. It's so stupid. If people dance with the joy of the Lord, fine, but if you referee it and work it up every Sunday, keep it. <coughs> I'm sure this man had a dancing heart and, a, and, and dancing feet are no substitute for a dancing heart. He beat his enemies, he, he drove, he rescued the perishing, he rescued the sheep, he rescued the lamb. And now he says, I've had that training. And he doesn't parade and say, oh, I'll show them my thing, I'll do my thing, I'll wear the king's helmet. Boy, I'm going to make an impression when I walk down. He doesn't want a thing that's got to do with the world and carnality. He says, my weapons are not carnal, they're mighty in God. You watch this, you angels, look on the new demons, watch this. And he goes with a ridiculous thing like a... A sling? Well, he takes the weak things to confound the mighty. Samson the Superman picks up the jawbone of an ass, and that must have been funny. And it was more powerful than an atom bomb. All this to say, let's pray and slay some of these giants. Believe God for them. I'm sick of reports. Oh, we've had such a marvelous thing. A preacher said to me today, well, these reports, thousands said, go three months after and see how many. My son wrote home the other day, he said, somebody said, we have 500 decisions. Go three months after and see how many of them are abiding fruit. Because God doesn't produce any abortions. If they don't come through, it's our fault, not God's. When we were in crusades, nobody ever came to the altar without somebody going with a Bible and sitting at the side of them. And if it took till one o'clock in the morning, Sometimes dozens and dozens. Oh, Nicholson used to say that till two o'clock in the morning. But before you left the building, you had to have assurance, not just sing it. Have you assurance you pass from death unto life? What assurance do you have and so forth? But now it's amazing. They say a few words, say a little prayer, and they go out as worldly tomorrow. They want as much TV. They want as much sport. They want to go to a bowling alley. They want to do some other thing. These are the people, people totally... Totally sold out, that's what he needs. My hands are his, my feet are his, my mind is his. This little guy isn't looking sideways, he isn't looking to see if his dad is there, he isn't looking to see if somebody's cheering him or his brothers, he isn't looking about the enemy frowning, he said, I've got to do a job and I'll do it for God. And he is my strength, I'm not my sufficient in myself, he's my strength and my shield, and he goes and does it. You see, this is more than a children's story for Sunday school. It's a national disaster. And one man got them out of it. Quickly, after a hundred years of darkness in Europe, God raised up one man, Martin Luther, and the world still feels the benefit of him. He raised up one man by the name of Whitfield. Whitfield was a pioneer, not Charles Wesley and John. They picked up the torch after Whitfield got them into stride. 
And yet they changed the history of the world. Gilmore went to Mongolia. Uh, Hudson went to China. Everybody talked about the great work Hudson Taylor did, but who preceded him? A man by the name of W.C. Burns. The great weeping prophet of Scotland. I stood outside of his church in Dundee once. And it says this is a church of uh, Robert McShane. They said every time he went to church, he went in the side office, he put his hands on the desk, put his head down, he wept and wept convulsively. He went up in the towering steps of the pulpit because of a big gallery, he had a high pulpit, and he put his elbows on the padded thing there, a pillow, a velvet pillow which most of them have, and he put his head down and he wept. And he prayed and he wept. He learned Hebrew, he was a brilliant Hebrew scholar, he learned... Uh, you see, you thought you're rusty. You young people don't bother you. Want to play a game? Why did they get down? Quit running around seeing folk. Get down and master language. Maybe God wants you in another country. You'll have to admit, you'll have to own up to your intellect one day. You'll have to account for your scholarship. You'll have to account for wasted years. And I try and get you to learn a language to do something while you have time. Well, McShane did that, okay. And he goes to be a missionary. And when he got there, God said, go back and pray for Scotland. And he went back and prayed for Scotland. But while he was away, about, I don't know, a year and a half, W.C. Burns went. The whole town was shaken from the center of the conference with the Holy Ghost revival. Paul plants Apollos waters, God gives the increase. So here is a man, and the anointing of God is in him. Well, he's shaken the town of Dundee, sent him to Glasgow, sent him to Edinburgh. No, 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 he said. I said last week, if God gives you ministries, I'd to say stop. And if you have sense, you'll do it. Forget everybody's opinion. And, and W.C. Burns had shaken that city as it had never been shaken before or since and God said go to China he went and he died almost in obscurity but he laid the foundation for the China Inland Mission he gets no credit Hudson Taylor gets it all so what in God's name does it matter Paul plants Apollos waters God gives the increase and God is looking for people who want to be obscure not predominant and seen and known forget it it's going to be shocking we head to heaven. Lots of these guys that have studied around the nation. The last should be first, the first should be last. I used to have problems over that. I don't now. Some of the most obscure people that weep at night, weep before you get up, weep after you've gone to bed. They're going to be there at the great day of judgment and we're going to stand amazed and say, I never thought that woman had that compassion. I never knew that man had that intercession. He's going to level it all out. That's the only thing that keeps me sane. Most people think I'm not. I think I am. <laughs> But the one thing that keeps me sane, shall not the judge of the old, the earth, all the earth do right? Yes. I see Christian preachers boasting. I see Christian men that get money and misuse it. And it used to break my heart. It doesn't now. They answer the judgment by God pity them. It's a difficult day. And it's not going to get easier. And if you can't be victorious in the secret, you won't be victorious in the public. If you can't slay the bear when you see it or the lion in the dark. If you can't be faithful when there's nobody there. I looked up that little saying, and I'm through with this today. I'm going to get it written out on a card. Make me little and unknown, loved and prized by the alone. Don't say, because God will take it word. He may be put you on the backside of the desert. Maybe one day you come to a gospel meeting for the next two years. Why should you? God, in God's name, what have you done with what you've heard the last three years? Why not get quiet and wait on him and say, I don't care. I, well, I don't go to any meetings, hardly any these days. I don't get to preach. Nobody wants me anyhow. I'm going to preach next week. Where is that? Chris, Grace Community Church. Next Saturday night and Sunday morning and Sunday night. So come if you want, but please pray.